Let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll read on down through the passage here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for this beautiful weather here in the Northwest and the time to come together and study around your word. Look at the book of Acts dispensationally considered and understand that even even a book of Acts, this transition, or especially a book of Acts, this book of transition, uh, is to be looked at dispensationally and that there are lessons to be learned. Um, not not direct doctrine, maybe, but there are certainly lessons that we need to learn out of the books at book of Acts, Lord. And we give you praise in all things in your name, Amen. Amen. So what I thought we'd do, we're down in um, Acts four. We'll, we'll pick it up in Acts four thirteen. But we've come down through here, and uh, Peter and John have uh, healed the lame man. We saw that picture of the little flock and and the apostate nation of Israel. We saw last time the big battle between Peter and the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin didn't know Peter had the Holy Ghost on his side. They're speaking through him, so he kind of cleaned the floor with them. Um, and we, we really focused last time on verses 11 and 12, that issue of Jesus Christ being that stone mm. that the builders rejected. And we went back to Isaiah. We saw those verses where he where they would have understood, being bi Old Testament biblical scholars, when he talked about that stone that was rejected with the other passage that went with it, he was really calling them out. Maybe we don't understand how how poignant that was or how aggressive that that statement was to them but they certainly would have understood it and then last time we really focused on the issue in verse 12 of everything is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ and that issue of you can be in everything is in Christ the little flock is in Christ they're not in the body of Christ but they are in Christ and we saw even even Paul talks about the ends of Romans 16 his kinsmen that were in Christ before him and we, we looked at those issues. And really the takeaway from that is, as I want everybody under, to understand, is that every promise God made is vested in Christ. Yeah. When we look at the cross, the cross is everything. Yeah. And when we say everything, we mean everything. You know, and, and our salvation, our, our redemption, our sanctification, all our spiritual blessings, they're all because of what he did on the cross and they're all vested in, in, in Christ. Israel can say the same thing. Our kingdom is, is vested in Christ as, as the king. Our salvation is going to be, as Israel speaking here, our salvation is going to be in Christ. Our, um, our, all our, the blessings we have from God are going to be vested in Christ. There's nothing that, there's nothing that Israel is going to receive outside of Christ any more than there is for us. And, and, and we, we really want to make sure we understand that, that issue, that, that everything, and, and, and I said this last time, and some people hear me say this and think I'm being disrespectful, and that's not at all my point. But if Jesus didn't succeed on the cross, if Jesus didn't finish his work on the cross, God would have a problem. And God would be a liar. Mm -hmm. Because everything was based on that issue. Mm -hmm. When he declared people righteous back there, Noah, David, Solomon, um, um, and, and those, and um, the prophets, he declared them righteous. But at that moment in time, there was no basis for that. But because he knew the cross was coming, then he could he could declare them righteous based on, right. on that long suffering. Well, that's why it's so important when God in the Bible talks about the faithfulness of Jesus. It is really important because when when this was all decided, God the Father had to be faithful to Jesus to to raise him from death, and Jesus had to be faithful to God the Father and and go to death. So I mean, they both had to really rely on each other, and it's more than just rely. Those aren't good words, but that's why the faithfulness, the faithfulness of yeah. Christ is so important. Tammy, Tammy Quakendale, who comes up from uh, on Sundays from, from Corvallis, you know, everybody has the, it seems everybody has their issue that has brought them to a conviction on the King James Bible. And a lot of, they're different reading. Mine's Philippians too. Other people have different, different things. That's, that's really that, that, that linchpin that got them. Tammy's is that issue of the faith of Christ. Where the new Bibles make it the faith in Christ, the King James makes it the faith of Christ. And that was really what she hung her hat on. And she said, but I get that. Yeah. Because that faith, you bring up the faith of Christ. Well, that is the whole basis of everything being in Christ. If Christ was not faithful, the faith of Christ, Christ's faithfulness, if he's not faithful, then there's nothing, then, then you put whatever's in Christ doesn't matter. You just, you can't count on it. So, what I want to, yeah. What was that uh, scripture again? Of Christ, faith and, of Christ. Yeah, which which that scripture? Oh, there's a bunch of them. The one uh, that, uh, Galatians two. Is there Philippians one? Galatians two, verse sixteen, uh, and verse 
What is that you just said? Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The new versions read it like this, and they change it some other things, but knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Totally. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Then you go to, again to Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me not I live by the faith in the Son of God yeah. which is completely different because the issues there is is Christ's faithfulness not our faithfulness because the fact remains our faith comes and goes we are more faithful some days than others but well, Christ and, and, and but, but Christ is, is consistent and we can we can rest in what he's done and, and it's a great verse on eternal security a great a great doctrine of eternal security is the faith of Christ if Christ was faithful and our salvation is in Christ because of what he finished on a, did on the cross, then we can trust in the promises made in Christ. But if it's based on our faithfulness, then we can't be. Because we know all know our faith comes and goes some days. You know? And so So what I thought today we'd do is just in Acts four, I just thought we'd read through the down through the the end of the chapter here, and I'll just get some commentary I'm gonna make on some of these verses and we'll We'll take a few rabbit trails here uh, before we get into to verse 5. So if you look at Acts 4 and verse 13. Verse 12, Peter's, you know, he's told them there's, you know, only in Christ is their salvation. So verse 13, Now when they, that's the Sanhedrin, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, it, it's very interesting here as we get as we get started in this passage, what 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 the Sanhedrin's viewpoint now all of a sudden that Peter and John is. It says, "Well, wait a second. Okay, they knew that they were unlearned and, and ignorant. They're not really calling them names. They're just knowing that they shouldn't know those scriptures, mm -hmm. but, but they did. Because they're fishermen, right? They're fishermen. I mean, yeah. and I mean, think about it today." You don't ex you don't expect deep deep biblical scholars out of people that got an eight to five job, right? Yeah. You know, Richard Jordan he he he'll tell you in his early ministry they lived out in the farm and they could only afford to go to town twice a week. So all he did eighty hours a week was just study the Bible. Well, you don't expect somebody that's a bricklayer or, or whatever then just probably doesn't have the time, right? So there's some, well, and some, they're not a Sadducee some some, some, who... some stipulate some some issues there. Yeah. So they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So they understood who these people were. They understood that they had actually been with Jesus. The Sanhedrin knew that Peter and John, they weren't clever. They, they, did, they didn't come up with some clever story to tell. The Sadducees, they actually knew that Peter and John, and they, they understand, you're going to start to see now, the Sanhedrin, they start to understand, and they acknowledge, they don't acknowledge it, but they know that Peter and John have been with the risen Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. They say, well, they're not learned. They don't know these scriptures. They're quoting these things back because they did see the Lord. They're believing their own testament. The Sanhedrin's actually believing what Peter and John is saying, though not publicly acknowledging it, right? Basically, the leaders knew in their heart mm -hmm. that the apostles had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they go to great lengths to try and cover it up, you know? Isn't it, the interesting thing? Isn't this true even today? It's not the crime that gets you; it's a cover up, right? You know they could have recovered from crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, but the cover up was what got them when they started to do all those things. Verse fourteen: uh, Beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred amongst themselves. Listen to this conversation they have, and they had to have it in private. As they kick everybody out of the room, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot mm -hmm. deny it. 
I mean, we, we've talked. They knew that that guy, you look down in verse, uh, where is it here? Verse 22, the man was 40 years old. We think we've talked about this. Everybody knew the man couldn't walk. He wasn't something that the local faith, he wasn't a, a stranger to the group. He wasn't mm -hmm. somebody that the local, the, the faith healer brought with him. They knew it, and they couldn't deny it. Even the Sanhedrin knew a miracle had been performed. I remember they said, well, you know, when we originally that, well, whose authority? Not good job, guys, but whose authority are you doing that? But look at what they wanted to do. They wanted to be kept quiet. But that it spread no further, verse 17, that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. They knew the truth. You see what's going on here? They knew the truth. They were actually acknowledging it among themselves. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want it. But they wanted it kept quiet. They didn't want. And now, why is that? Why did? Why would? Think about it from the Sanhedrin's viewpoint. Why would they would not want that to get out? It uh, throws a wrench in what they stood for, basically. Exactly. They it, it, in the right. It, it stood. It's, it, it threw a wrench in their plan. What? What? Are they, who are they? Who, who is the Sanhedrin? They're the leaders of the nation, aren't they? They. If this gets out, they're going to lose the kingdom. The kingdom's going to be taken away from them. And they did not want to lose that. Look over at Matthew 21. We'll keep a hand in Acts, but look over at Matthew 21. I think we looked at this maybe a couple of weeks ago, but... It's good to go over again, because this comes up a lot, a lot of questions about this one. So Matthew 21 and verse 42. And, and think about this, this whole thing that Jesus is about to say before he's crucified should remi remind us of what Peter said over there in Acts. Verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become of the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We've looked at those scriptures, and that's exactly what Peter says. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whom all whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. But you hear that? You trip over him, you fall over him, you're broken to pieces, but you're recoverable, right? You put Humpty Dumpty back together, you can ask for forgiveness. But if this stone falls on you, it's grind you to powder. There, there's nothing There's left. nothing. You're not done. buildable. Yeah. Verse 45. When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Just like the Sanhedrin are fearful of him because they saw Peter and John, they saw him do the miracle. Here, they're, they're fearful of the people. But in verse 43, this issue, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. That's the Pharisees, the chief priests. We've seen that the chief priests were the Sanhedrin. So that was those ruling body. And given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So the question is, who's the nation? And it's often said, well, it's the Gentiles. Well, be well, because it says nation is the little flock, but if it said nations, it would be um, Gentiles. Right. It, it, it's not the Gentiles. First of all, right. we, we know Jesus came to Israel. We've, right. We've seen those. But, and April's got a good point. When you see the word nation, it's speaking of Israel. Unless it's clearly defined, that nation, Egypt, that nation, such and such. But whenever you see it say nation, it's referring to Israel. Nations... Because what nation are the Gentiles? What nations? What nation are the Gentiles? There are a bunch of them, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, a bunch. I mean, even even in the time of Jesus, there were still people afar off that were part of the Roman Empire. Look over at Luke twelve. Yeah. Luke 12, how 
Yeah. Verse 29. Luke 12, 29. And seek not ye what ye... This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the apostles. Seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek the kingdom of God, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Remember Peter said, silver and gold have I none? Mm -hmm. The guy wanted alms, right? Silver and gold have I none? Um, verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, what kingdom is it? It's the kingdom we read about in Matthew that's being taken from the religious leaders. So you see where the nation, you're right, the nation is that little flock. Verse 33, Still that ye have and give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. So you see, that's exactly what Peter and John did. They didn't have the money, they sold what they had, and now the, the Sanhedrin, as they're seeing this miracle take place, and all the people acknowledging the miracle, the guy's been there for isn't it interesting too? It's forty. The guy's been there forty years. There's a number that comes up over and over in the Bible, yeah, doesn't 40. it? Forty. Yeah, Jesus forty days in the wilderness. Net the nations forty years in the wilderness. How often for it? Moses in the mountain forty years. But it's forty. Forty days, days excuse me. So, and then uh, one more. Look over at Luke twenty two twenty nine. What does forty mean? You know? Like it, it, it's it's a number. It's a number that God. I mean, there's a lot of things in it. It's eight times five. New be, eight is eight is a new beginning. Uh huh. You know, there's a, there's a lot five of different things. But, but but so often it just it seems to be the time that God chooses to educate people. Yeah, that's what it seems like. What did I say? Luke 22, verse 29. Uh, verse 24, so there's this discussion about well, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. He said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I among you am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on there in Acts 4. They're worried that, they're going to live, that that kingdom is going to be taken from them, because they're in charge of that kingdom now. It's going to be taken from them and given to the little flock, who is represented by who? Peter and John, right? Yeah. yeah right. They're the exact people that are going to get that. So I'll go back and go back to Acts 4. Um, verse 17. That spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. It's amazing the depths of what they're willing to go to. They've acknowledged the miracle's taken place. They've asked the people that did the miracle, whose name did you do it in? Jesus' name. They've been completely rebuked by these ignorant, unlearned men, so clearly the Holy Spirit's in them, and they still are so wrapped up in their own power that they are not willing to let these guys go and speak in the name of Jesus in, anymore. And I love, love their answer. Though. Look at what they answered. Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be in right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. He even asks them, You tell me, should we do what God says, or should we do what man says? They wouldn't please men. They, wouldn't, they were not going to please men. They were going to serve God. Verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And boy, that had to put the fear, well, literally the fear of God in, in those guys. Think about all the things that they had seen and heard. From the time of their calling, so from the time of John the Baptist when he said, there's the Lamb of God, to their calling, all the miracles that he did, he's crucified and then resurrected again, and now they're healing. Plus all the stuff that they've heard. You know, during the uh, 
when Jesus was being tried and so on and so forth, and Peter denied him. Uh, when now then with the Holy Spirit, uh, you can't stop him. And the thing of it is, when uh, like when they hear him and he's speaking with boldness now, right. I mean he's speaking with power. That's right. And yet they they don't still don't it doesn't register. I mean it didn't, they don't. Uh, uh, they're still going to defy it. They're going to defy it because they want their yeah. power. They want to pray. You know, it's interesting too, the two people we're talking about here in this account are Peter and John. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to turn there, but the, the last thing John writes in his, in his gospel, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Mm. And Peter and John, and, uh, Peter and, and John tells the Sanhedrin, Hey, we can't speak with anything what we have seen and heard. And John's opinion is all the stuff he's seen and heard would fill all the books in the world. He got a lot to say. You talk about power. Yeah. You know, you got that you got that power there. Verse 21, you see that they get victory. Acts 4:21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified for that which was done. They got victory. They remained true to God. And glorified God. And the Sadducees did not beat them. And that's, it's very interesting. Now, it doesn't always turn out that way, right? There are many times that they did get beat. But, you know, it reminds me, you know, of what some of the things happened to Daniel. You know, he got put in a furnace and put in the lion's den and God protected him. Here, speaking through the Holy Spirit, and it, it's interesting what, what it says here. They wanted to find a way to punish them. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't figure out a way to do it and keep the people happy. Same thing that Pilate was trying to figure out how to do when he crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I not do this and keep the people happy? Verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company, reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David, David has said, Why did the heathen rage, rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So I want to talk a little bit about these two passages, these two verses here. Um, is there anything, and this may seem like an interesting open-ended question that could have a million answers, and it's probably true, but is there one specific thing that jumps out of you in verse 20, out at you in verse 25 when you read it? Kings and the rulers. Well, that's in verse 26. No. But in verse 25, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, so we're gonna go read this. We're gonna. This is Psalm two. We're gonna, we're gonna go read it here in a second. But what Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, is saying, is David spoke it. David wrote it down, but it was God speaking. It's it's a wonderful verse about the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. And I hope I would assume everybody in, in the room here un understands that issue. But that's something that's totally under attack. Oh, it's just written by a bunch of men. Well, yeah. that was inspired by God. This verse says that David wrote it down. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, but God said it. He just used the mouth of David to mm -hmm. say it. And then when we go and look at this, you're going to see that we get a little more um, clarity on, on what's being said back in Psalm 2. One, before we go over to Psalm 2, though, I want us to look at in verse 26, it says, Kings of the earth stood up. Okay, who would the kings of the earth be? The Sadducees. That would be just the kings of the earth, right? Yeah. The, the, the kings, the rulers of all the individual nations. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. In the context here, who would the rulers be? The Pharisees. Exactly. Look back at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with mm -hmm. the Holy Ghost, said to them, mm -hmm. Ye rulers of the people... Yeah. and elders of Israel. So he's saying, you know, everybody had a part to play in the crucif crucifying of the Lord Jesus Christ here. Could the kings of the earth be priests too? I, I think it to be kings. 
Yeah. God pretty much, in Israel's program, there was a king, a priest, and a prophet. And a priest could not be a king. And yeah. a king could not be a priest. And that's what got uh, Saul in so much trouble. He tried to be a, he tried to be a priest. So a king, a, a king the, the Jesus Christ, of course, is all three. But he's the only one. Um, a, a king would be a king. And the ruler would be just you know, would be whoever the ruler of that nation, of the individual nation would be. And in the context here, it's the rulers of Israel. So with that in mind, come back to Psalm 2. And when we come to Psalm, we want to remember it's not a book of daily devotions to have in the morning with our coffee, though that is fine to do, but we need to understand what's going on. They are prophetic. Every one of them is prophetic. And what is an interesting study to do is when you read them, figure out who's speaking. Is it the little flock? Is it uh, an apostate nation? Or is it the Lord Jesus Christ himself? And sometimes it can be very difficult. Sometimes it jumps back and forth. Look at Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage, rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, now you see here, so now, with what we know, just learned in Acts 4, we're talking about the kings of the earth and the rulers of the nation of Israel here. So we're talking everybody is, is raging. Everybody is against the Lord. You say they all take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. Yeah, it's all the same uh, terminology and writing as if it was in uh, Acts. And Acts 4 says, uh, Psalm 2 says, and against his anointed. Acts 4 says against his Christ. That word Christ simply means anointed. Mm -hmm. Satan has a Christ. We don't, remember, we don't talk about it very much, but the Satan does in fact have a Christ because the word simply, and it simply means anointed. Now, we talk about Christ and, and we with more respect than that. Right. Verse 3. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Is it talking about all the apostasy, the, the, the rulers of the na the kings of the world and the rulers of the nation. He's right, he's gonna have them in derision. Mm -hmm. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And we're gonna come back and I want to look at that phrase in a minute, but ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So you see here's a reference to the, that, that coming earthly Davidic kingdom. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Remember we, we talked about, we saw the one about the rock. You, you fall on the rock and you're going to the stone. You're going to break. But if the stone falls on you, it's going to grind you into dust. Uh -huh. Shall dash him in pieces like a potter's vessel. Yeah. Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. It's a great, it's a great uh, prophetic psalm about that coming kingdom you know lest he be angry and you perish when his wrath is kindled but a little not a lot of wrath from god but a little bit of yeah, wrath. yeah which is enough yeah ex exactly <laughs> exactly so david wrote this but Acts says this is the lord speaking here and it's interesting how it so it says in verse 7 Right, we were talking about well, who's speaking. Verse seven is clearly the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. I have set, I have, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, "Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee." So I want to take a couple of minutes, and I want to look at this issue of, "Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee," because. There's two different 
issues with this issue of begotten. Um, so often we think about it about his birth, mm -hmm. but it's more than that. And the, fr fr the phraseology that the Bible uses is very, very consistent. So what I want us to do, how do I want to do this? Okay, keep a hand here and look over to Acts 13. Acts 13 and verse 33. It says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You said that he raised him up again. Is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, right. Raised up Jesus again, mm -hmm. as it is also written in the second psalm, mm -hmm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So, begotten mm -hmm. is referring to what? Well, it's a birth. It's a birth. It's a, it's a yeah. beginning. It's a... But, but, but at, what event occurred that made God mm -hmm. say, God the Father say to God the Son, this day have you are my son, this day have I begotten me. The resurrection. So when we're over in Psalm 2, the issue going on in Psalm 2 is the issue of his resurrection, not his birth. This is not a psalm talking about when he came to earth in his earthly ministry. This is about talking about when he's going to come back in his day of in the day of wrath. Say that again. Okay, Psalm two yeah. is is referring to his resurrection, right. not his first coming. <laughs> so with right. Psalm two, we don't read Psalm two thinking it's his first coming. We understand it's going to be his resurrection. Right. How did the Pharisees and the Sadducees want to read it? As the the first verse. They wanted the first coming to be the second coming. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that you got to remember with the, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Their excuse that they used for not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is they were expecting the conquering hero. Mm -hmm. They were expecting what they anticipated at the second coming, not the Lamb of God. They wanted no part of that. They want somebody to come and take them away from Rome. Right. And the Sadducees and Pharisees think they're going to be the ones ruling with the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're not, you know, with the anointed, as it would be the way they'd put it. That's what they say. But in their hearts, they want the kingdom. They don't want that. They don't want that anointed from God. Let us be it. That that's what their issue there is. Um, look over at Revelation one verse five. Exactly, and, and that, that's the issue right there, first begotten of the dead. Verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who was the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the issue, when, it, when, it, when you see that word first begotten, what's it talking about? Is it talking about Mary's first child? No. 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 From the dead. Or resurrected, right? The reason I'm going through this is so often I've heard so many people say and talk about when you, you see that word begotten, oh yeah, that means he was, be, she, he was begotten through Mary. Well, yes, but that's not what we're talking about. Right. We're, 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 and when, we, when the Bible uses the word begotten and first begotten, it's referring to that resurrection. It's referring to that issue of coming back with power that we're going to see when we get over to Romans uh, on, on Sunday is that the issue is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was resurrected with power. 
declared to be the Son of God with, with, with power because he's been resurrected. He's the first of many, first of many brethren. So then come over and look at John 1. John 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So what's that referring to? Jesus. Right, but, but his, first his, his first birth, right? Yeah. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that phrase, only begotten, what does it <coughs> refer to? The birth. The birth. And how do you know? Well, the context, for one, it said, right? That he hadn't died yet. Right, in John he hadn't died yet. Look at uh, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's referring to his physical birth. And you see it one more time over in Hebrews 11 and verse 17. That's Hebrews what? 11, 17. And this is actually not speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's speaking of Isaac. But you get the def you, it, it. So when it says only begotten, that is um, the physical birth. The birth. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and that he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. So it, that clearly that would be talking about the, the birth of Isaac, right? Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that, though? What's interesting about that? Was Isaac, his, Isaac was not Sorry, Abraham's was only son? Was Ishmael, right? He was the son of promise. Who was the anointed of who 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 was the, the anointed of those two though? Isaac. 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 Yeah, it's just interesting how you you see the, the terminology. You got to pay attention to it. So again, for me, that that is that is a a, a study w well worth doing to understand how the, those those the Bible defines those terms, so that every time we come across the word begotten, we don't think of Jesus in the manger. One of them is where he came back. As a suffering, it came as a suffering servant uh, to Israel, but once we come back with power. Mm -hmm. That was uh, that's the standard way of thinking. No, I, I used to think that way that begotten meant his physical birth in a manger. Uh, mm -hmm. But yet, when you stop and think, uh, Jesus, when he was on earth doing the ministry, he was talking about uh, the like the farmer's terminology that grain has to die in order to come back you know to so he had to die in order that he could be uh, born that'd be a, a spiritual birth more or less yeah exactly and in fact it is he's the first fruits mm -hmm. he had if he hadn't come up we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't be spiritually born that's right right, right. So, that's exactly right do you know specifically what the word begotten means? Definition. Well, uh, yeah, you look over at Luke. Uh, Luke one. <coughs> Luke one or Matthew one. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew one. Dictionary, that green dictionary right there says begotten means procreated or generated. But you can figure out real quick here from Matthew 1. 
the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, see, uh, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Judas begat. What's the begat mean in the in the passage? Oh, yeah, yeah, had, had you know, yeah, sired. If you want to use that term, mm -hmm. but yeah, and it's all the way through. An interesting thing. You guys, I, I, look, you said you like things, so we'll take a little rabbit trail. I'll show you something that I find very interesting. Keep your hand here in Matthew 1 and get Genesis 5. Matthew 1 and then Genesis 5. I think so, yeah. Yeah. So, from verse 2 to verse 16 in Matthew, everything is begat, 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 all the way down to the last one. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. It was all begat about begatting. About li and what, what, what do we say? Life, right? You give life. Yeah. You begat something, you, you give it life. Chapter 5 of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And what do we, okay, this is the book of the generation of Adam. What's Matthew 1? It's the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day he then, when they were created. Adam lived 130 years, begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. The days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Verse 7, or verse 8, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Verse 11, all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. Verse 14, all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Verse 17, all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and 5 years, and he died. Verse 20, and he died. Uh... Verse 24, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Verse 27, and he died. Verse 31, and he died. Chapter 5 of, Ge of Genesis is the generation of Adam, and everybody dies. Mm -hmm. Matthew 1 is the generation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is life, and everybody gets life. Isn't that an amazing way that the Bible presents those two? It's like the guy that wrote Genesis 5 knew in 2,000 years when Matthew was going to write down, he was going to compare it. And we're all dead in Adam, in Adam but we're all alive in Christ, aren't we? And that, that's just, to me, that gives me goosebumps. I just, that I just fascinates me about the Word of God. So when people come along and say, oh, it's just a bunch of men that wrote it, I go, how can that be? It's too complex. For it, it, it's too complex, <laughs> and it's just too amazing because you look at Adam, you're dead in Adam. You look at Christ, you're alive in Christ. So that had nothing to do with anything. Well, that, I like that. Want to chase another rabbit? Yeah. Uh, Genesis five two. What does it say? It says, <clears throat> "Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam." He didn't say Adam and Eve. It does not say Adam. And Eve. Yeah. Mrs. Adam. Mrs. Yeah, Adam. Mrs. Adam. <laughs> yeah. This was before Eve. Yeah, it is. She was in there. Because God took Eve out of Adam. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most people never even see that. Because Eve was made of Adam. Mm -hmm. Woe man. And man of the womb. Their name Adam. Yeah, that's really good. And Adam all die, and Christ is life. Okay, go back to Acts. Okay, verse 27. And this is, you know, this is a, a really a, a prayer of, of Peter and John, verse twenty-seven. 
For of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. He's got everybody there. Yeah. He's got the Gentile leaders. He's got the Gentiles. He's got Israel and their leaders. He's got everybody. And the people of Israel will gather together for to do whatsoever soever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Now here's another verse that's a little verse with not very many words that can be glossed over very quickly and it needs to be appreciated for what it is. I've heard very well-meaning Christians say this even. Boy, it just seems like God's always on the run. It's like Satan's always doing something to thwart God's plan. But this verse said right here says to do whatsoever and Peter's praying to God. And he says that Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel they were gathered together to do what your hand God and what your counsel determined should be done. God knew it was going to happen. Human people did it. But God knew he was going to do it. Now think about that with the verse over in Corinthians where it talks about if they'd known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Right. Now we're now all of a sudden now we're back to this little secret that God kept. And then not only a little bit, it's just it's just a key, it's just, just a secret. You know? That the battle was won because God because Satan, we looked at this last time, I think, Satan couldn't figure out that secret. Though he was wiser than Daniel, who was had the secrets revealed to him, he couldn't figure out that if he crucified the Lord of glory, not only was he going to give up earth, but he was going to give up the heavenly places. Right. And that was God's plan all along. All along. Well, you know, when people think that uh, Satan is uh, creating a problem for God, God allows us to have a, um, a choice in what we do. But... And all it, you take all the people who live on the face of this earth, ever has or ever will, yet God's plan is right on track. That's yep. right. Right. That's right. Look yeah. back at, if you're in Acts 2, look back at, or you're in Acts, look back at Acts 2 and verse 23. Where are we? Uh, Acts 2, verse 23. Him, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Peter condemns Israel and gives glory to God on the same event. That's amazing. You guys are a bunch of rascals, even though you did what God knew was going to happen, but you ought to repent about it. God, you're a genius. <laughs> that's spiritual maturity. Uh -huh. And actually, he's full of the Holy Spirit. That's full. Yeah, I actually went and looked up one day. What does that word determinate mean? It says because it says determinate counsel and foreknowledge, decisive, conclusive, established, settled, resolute, fixed, and definite. There ain't no getting around it. God made His mind if that was going to happen. Yeah. Done deal. Go back to what you opened the evening about April with the faith of Christ. Mm -hmm. So often we think that Christ was faithful from the time he was born for the 33 years it took him to get to the cross. But Christ was faithful from the time they came up with their plan. Yeah. And in, in eternity past. They come up with their plan. Well, somebody's got to go to earth. Jesus, I'll do it. I'll go get in that silly little body we made down and I'll be stuck in it forever and I'll live a perfect life and I'll rely completely on the word of the Father and that'll be acceptable payment for sin. And he's okay, good plan. So however long that took to get to here, and then that's 6,000 years, and then this 33 years, that's the faith of Christ. It's just not a 33-year period or a three-year period when you come to understand it. From the time they, ha they hatched their plan, I said respectfully, till then is how he was faithful and how he understood this predetermined counsel of God. Okay, um, trying to get through the chapter here. I don't know if we will. Uh, verse 20, okay, we got, that was 28. Verse 29, 
And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Keep your hand here. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 19. Ephesians 6, 19. We wore this verse out when we were doing our Ephesians oh, study. Yeah. Paul's asking for the Ephesians to pray for him. And uh, the last request he asked for them regarding that prayer is that they would pray, and for me, that utterance may get, be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in bonds. You know, it's interesting. Peter and John and Paul, they all pray the same thing. Paul, Peter, or Paul, I mean, you got to assume Paul prayed that for himself, but he asked for people to pray that he would speak boldly for the very same thing that got him in trouble. Now, Peter says, hey, you know, I just got in trouble just to skate, skate by the hair of my chinny chin chin, and will you, God, help me to continue to be that bold. Help me to get more and get in trouble again. But what's interesting Neither one of them, neither one of them prayed for deliverance from right. their events. Neither one of them prayed to let me speak boldly without any trouble. The issue was just let me speak boldly. Didn't want the circumstance. The didn't have to have the circumstances taken away, but had wanted the intimidation taken away. Didn't want to. Didn't want to, in the face of that intimidation to continue to speak boldly. Peter requested a sign, though. Paul never requested that sign. Verse 29, Acts 4. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant them thy servants, that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, mm. and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy they child, proof back Jesus. Then. Isn't that something? At this point, they're still looking for signs and wonders as evidence of God. Yeah. Think about everything that we just read about Peter here in this chapter. Full of the Holy Spirit, took it to the Sanhedrin, quoted Scripture, did knew what that meant, <laughs> did a healed the lame man that been healed that, that couldn't walk for forty years, and he says, "God, please help me continue. And if you would, would you give me some signs and wonders so I know you're going to continue to me?" There's a dispensational change. There's a dispensational change right there. Both praying for the same thing, but Peter's looking for signs and wonders as manifestation of God's promise. Paul. In the dispensation of grace, understands he's not, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Completely yeah, different good, good here. There. Um, seeing those wonders, seeing those healings and miracles, it would strengthen them internally. Yeah. Paul was expecting the prayer to result in a wor inner working. In him. Paul says yeah. in Philippians that it's God that works in us. The word of God works effectually in you that believe. He never says, okay, Paul never says, all right, you see those signs and wonders out there? That's God manifesting. When you see signs and wonders, and you know you can safely speak boldly. Complete yeah, different dispensational difference. change there. Both in the Word of God. There's no evidence here that Peter's at anywhere out of the will of God. I mean, Peter's right in the heart of the will of God on this right. one. Right. But dispensationally, there's, there's a different issue going on. The Jews require a sign. Greeks require wisdom. And that, and that, and that, 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 that interesting. Signs and wonders are for Israel's program. Mm -hmm. And they manifest things. They manifest God's presence amongst them. Um, I've heard, uh, and I've, I've probably even said it myself, the different things that we see, and well, that, that verifies that God is, is uh, protecting or He's doing and so on and so forth. And uh, I was listening to John Verstegen uh, on another Jesus, mm -hmm. and uh, he brought that out just like in Second Corinthians, where it talks about we knew him before, but we don't know him anymore. No, not. But yet it's the same person, but it's a different program. It's a different program. And, um, and, and, and but as we think about, it's like he's talking about Peter and then Paul. I mean, there's, there's a difference there. With, um, I mean, Peter looking for signs, yeah. and we we did that, you know, in, in our churches, and we we do that 
continually. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but that's um, uh, like I say, I've, I've been guilty of it myself. But uh, we're in in, in Saint Corinthians says we know him no more, not as we not as after the flesh. We know him after yeah. the flesh no more. Yeah. That's exactly right. But he's talking about that, um, you know, in, in that, you know, the Satan's ministers. And if you just stop and think about it, because like in, in uh, uh, first uh, chapter in Galatians, where Paul talks about teaching another gospel, uh, which is not another, but there be those that pervert it. And so, in I think what John was bringing out is our pastors today is doing that same thing. They are. They're... They're, they're preaching and teaching that other... <laughs> Another Jesus. Yeah, yeah. The one that's not for us right. today. Right. Yep, yep. I know it's so interesting when you read that. Another Jesus. How could that be? Yeah. It's happening today. Yeah. And he made it very yeah. clear. It's not talking about some Eastern religion God or, or something. You know, it's like, another Jesus. Yeah. yeah, and I found that really interesting Where, where's too. Where's that verse that you say, Ephesians 6? Uh, 6, uh, 619, the one about Paul asking for the prayer. Yeah, six nineteen. And this is to uh, this is the, the letter to the Ephesians, but back in Acts nineteen, when he was in Ephesus, which I think I talked to him about earlier, maybe you, he was doing signs and wonders. Oh, he does them all the way up to the all the way up to the end of the chapter of Acts. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Acts twenty eight. Look at Acts twenty eight. Acts 28, verse 8. This is the last chapter of, of Acts. I mean, he's got a shipwreck, he's going to go to Rome, and the book of Acts is going to end. Uh, and it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux. Um, you know, sometimes I wish the Bible maybe wouldn't give quite so much information. Uh, <laughs> but to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. You know, he gets bit with the snake, shakes the snake off, and he's he's fine. So yeah, uh, there was a purpose for it. Absolutely, but it but it, it, but it, it faded off. And the, the main purpose for for Paul to do it is it, it was it proved that he was in fact an apostle, because signs and miracles are the signs of an apostle. You know, um, and we've, we've you know we talked about it before. You get this guy who, who's persecuted the twelve apostles that you know, heal these people. Don't forget that's still coming. And he says, oh, yeah, you know what? I changed my mind. I'm an apostle, too. <laughs> sure you are, Paul. Uh-huh. Yeah, staying away. But if he could come and do true miracles, and he could. You know, he, healing these guys, the snake doesn't get him. People send him hankies, and he'd send them back, and, and they'd be healed. Um, so, yeah, but, but eventually, you get towards the end of his ministry, he can't heal Timothy. He can't heal himself. He can't heal Epaphroditus. Because um, those things have, have, have faded off. Because yeah, we have the completed word of God, you know, and he, he probably could do him a good portion. You know, Second Timothy is the last book he wrote, but you know, he probably not right up to the end, but close to the end, he was probably still still doing them um, until uh, for sure until he penned Second Timothy. You know that right there when he's talking about the, uh, he's had the word of God now. Uh, that's one that one scripture where it says when that which is perfect is come. Mm -hmm. It talks about these things that would be done away with. Well, and, and that we I think we're all in, in agreement would be that is the completed word of God that we have today. Uh, Paul didn't have that, and that you know as he's 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 helping bring it to us, <laughs> you know, as he's writing these letters. Right. But m big majority of churches that I've ever been in. If that's ever brought up, they're always talking about it something else. And I guess that keeps the door open for all of these speaking in tongues and all these other things. Because it says, when that which is perfect is come, these things will be done away with. Right. Yeah. I say this with respect. 
and people that I say this about would deny that they think this way, people do not want to have a completed Word of God. They want to do the signs and, and miracles. They want to do the speaking and tongues. They want to get a new revelation from God. Now, I don't think there's very many Christians that would want to stay up and say, no, I don't believe the word of God's completed. But when somebody comes along and says, yeah, I was driving down and God, God came and told me to turn left. That's an extra biblical revelation. If you can't get what you need out of the Bible, then the Bible is insufficient. And you're right, people fundamentally don't want that because that's the whole that's theoretically that's what the whole thing with speaking in tongues is now it's that's not what it is but it's supposed to be for the edification of the yeah. church right but right. now that which is perfect has come that now replaces right. for the edification of the church and of the saints you're exactly right um all right let's go back to acts here we're not going to get through but we'll get a little bit more. we'll get this this <laughs> section done um acts four In verse thirty-one, and when they pray, when uh, one more thing, I, I just noticed, verse thirty, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Remember when they the the leper asked them, well, how'd you, how'd you do this? In the name of Jesus, be healed. The Sanhedrin said, well, by what authority? By the name of Jesus. I don't want you speaking in the name of Jesus anymore. And yet, at this very time, they still didn't take credit in their prayer to God. They still had that, that complete understanding that, hey, everything I'm doing is because of you, God. They, they weren't taking any credit for it in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God mm. with boldness. There's, there's really a picture of life in the kingdom. You see a sign and a wonder, and then they, the, and then they do speak the word of God boldly. It's really kind of a picture, a small little picture in one verse of the kingdom life. They're going to, that's what they're going to do. The Gentiles are going to come and they're going to, the Gentiles are going to ask them hard questions. That's okay. And they're going to have an answer and they're going to speak mm -hmm. boldly. And, some, and it may intimidate them, but they're going to speak boldly. And, and that is very definitely a picture of kingdom life there. Uh, verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them, Aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Right? They wanted to speak boldly. Mm -hmm. This verse says, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection. Verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had needed. Um, I think we'll pick up here because there's a couple things I want to say about that. So yeah, well, that, this is where we'll pick up yeah, next time. Okay. Almost got to the end of the chapter, and you guys didn't know I could go through six or seven or eight verses in one setting, did you? Almost so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it was a sprint. <laughs> but yeah, there's some good, there's some good stuff there. <laughs> Are you aware that there's a group in uh, some? Christians in Portland who practice this. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware specifically, but I'm not. I'm not surprised. Uh, the the uh, pastor who came to Pendleton uh, while I was there. I don't remember how I got connected with him, but he became, he was the new pastor of the First Baptist Church in. Uh, Pendleton. Pendleton. He came from this group in Portland to be the pastor. And we got together and I, I covenanted with him to help support him as long as he, I could see that the congregation was having difficulties and he was teaching some hard things that they didn't want to hear, but they were true. And I just went to him privately and told him that I'll, I'll be helping support you in this until you release me from it. And it wasn't too long later that he came to, he came to me and he said, uh, 
I can see that these people don't want to know the truth. So I'm going back to Portland to oh, wow. the group that I came from. Wow. Another thing happened, <clears throat> and I'm not this. Well, I just tell you what happened, and, and it, I I can't explain it uh, other than just how it happened. Uh, one of the guys who worked for me, uh, he came to me one night at my home, and he said, um, I've had such a terrible pain in my stomach and in my abdomen for a while now, and he said, it's to where I can't, almost can't stand it. And uh, <laughs> this, this will tell you where I was way back then. And he said, uh, what can you do? And I said, uh, well, the scripture says, uh, call for the elders and know you with oil and pray for you. And he said, well, you can pray for me. I said, yeah, but I'm not an elder. So I called the church and this pastor was there. They were decorating for Christmas. And I told him what the situation was, and there was a silence on the other end of the phone for a little bit. Then he said, okay, bring him over. So I took him over, and I introduced Jim to the pastor, and told him what we were there for. And he said, just a minute, and he left. He went down to the uh, kitchen, got some olive oil, come back up, and he anointed him with oil and prayed for him, and Jim was healed. <laughs> he never had a pain in his stomach again wow. after that ever. <laughs> now, that's what happened. Uh, and this pastor, after later on, I told him that Jim has no pain and he hasn't had since then. And he said. Wow, I've never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's interesting that there's that there, because we're going to see now that it it, it doesn't work. It won't work in the dispensation of grace. Um, the, the this whole I mean, there's countries that have tried it because what's the problem? What is 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 the problem the system, or is the problem people? Mm. It's the people, and uh, um, it, it's it's not. For you. I mean, we've, we've been through it. We'll be through. We'll both through it again when we get there. But yeah, there are. I know there. Are, there's a. There are healthcare organizations that are based on this, and I know a couple people there, and they scare me to death. You know, you just we, we, we put out the call. You sign up, so you, you you meet your legal definition of healthcare, and they put out the call, and then we ask everybody to give fifteen dollars, and then all that money goes to whoever's sick, and a scary way to have healthcare. I'm sorry. Well. There's there's a couple organizations now doing it that are very very successful. Yeah, I know it. I know it. And uh, oh, it scares me. Okay, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have your word that we can come and and, and study. And uh, one of the big takeaways today, Lord, is just your your using using your word that the Bible declaring that what is written in the Bible is in fact your your words. Um, that David spoke your words. You spoke by the mouth of David the prophet. So that when we come to the scriptures, uh, we know it's not any man's opinion, any man that wrote it, but it truly is the word of God written down through human authors, but inspired by the word of God. They're actually your words that you wanted down on the page, Lord. Um, and we look through here and we, we see some dispensational differences, but also the issue that we should uh, continue to pray for ourselves and, and for one another, that we would continue to speak boldly in the form of uh, in the, the face of any kind of intimidation or fear um, at whatever level it is, Lord, and always be ready to prepare to, to give a witness and to stand and be an ambassador for Christ, Lord. We give you praise, we give you glory in all things. In your name, amen. amen.